You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me today are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We're the editors of Manufacturing.net and Industrial Equipment News, and each have about 15 years covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we cover the five biggest stories in manufacturing and the implications they have on the industry going forward. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and share the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by giving the podcast a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. Finally, to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IN.com. And please put email the podcast in the subject line. How are you guys doing today? Good, David. How are you? Oh, a little keyed up today. A little keyed up today, Anna. <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> right? I'm so keyed up. I said today in one syllable. How are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meow. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, let's jump into it. The first story this week is about a dam, a dam that could fail in a large earthquake. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says that a large earthquake could cause the spillway gates of the Detroit Dam in Detroit, Oregon, to buckle, causing a potentially catastrophic flood. An earthquake of such magnitude is expected in the Pacific Northwest sooner or later. To minimize the danger by reducing the maximum oh to minimize the danger by reducing the maximum height of the lake to minimize the danger the engineers are going to reduce the maximum height of the lake by 5 feet starting in April hundreds of thousands of people live downstream from the Detroit dam which is built in the 1950s the move comes as Oregon and the wider Pacific Northwest are coming to grips with quote the big one that experts say is coming Anna, a little doom and gloom to start off. Yeah, we're really <laughs> keeping it light <laughs> as usual on this podcast. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so this was kind of a crazy story and really scary. Um, I think the story talks about how they're planning to, or they're just kicking off with like a shake alert system, right? Where right. you can have texts um, alert you if there's an earthquake in your area. And they say that those kind of systems like can really be critical in preventing um, additional unneeded deaths. People are able to like get a, a little bit of a heads up, to, tr but it's a, it's a very quick heads up, right? Yeah, no, I looked into it. And so uh, the chances of this problematic quake are 37% that is going to happen in the next 50 years. And this is according to a researcher at the Oregon State University. Uh, and this shake alert system I found particularly interesting because it's created by the U.S. Geological Society, and it sends alerts to your smartphones. Now, there's kind of two options. You can either get them likely too often, which would make sure that people stop paying attention to them, but it would give you a longer lead time. So it would s send you an alert that would say like, light shaking in 45 seconds, 48 seconds. Or you could have them less frequently, but you might not get as much of a lead time. It's like the one example was very strong shaking in eight seconds. And that is, I mean, uh, in the one text just said, drop, cover, hold on, protect yourself. I mean, Jeff, what do you do if you receive that text message? <laughs> I mean, drop, in eight cover, seconds. protect myself? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, if you were talking about like things that could be movies, I think we've seen this movie before. Mm -hmm. Is is this the part where somebody goes, you know, it's only a two and three chance or a one and three chance of this happening in the next fifty years? Yeah. Um, but I think the the one positive, I think, uh, or at least I was kind of, we talked about infrastructure last time. We did talk about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, they are being proactive here, which is a positive thing. There's a lot of infrastructure improvements that tend to wait for something bad to happen before there's a lot of uh, momentum or energy or investment into it. Obviously, they need to do more things here, but at least they are looking at it from a proactive perspective. It's also a little ironic that this place was just sort of hit by those forest fire, those wildfires last year, so now they're having issues with the dam, with water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then they always also said, like, lowering this water level is just a short-term solution. So you wonder when they're looking at investments, is there something bigger they need to do? I mean... Do people need to continue being in the path of this potential dam breaking? Is yeah. there something that needs to be done? Do there need to be some sort of evacuation efforts? If it's going to be over the next 50 years, you would think there's possibly time mm -hmm. um, to, to do something on that scale. Obviously, nobody wants to do that. But if I have to worry about being flooded out of my home, I mean, mm -hmm. what yeah. are the 
the trade-offs are. At some point, I mean, uh, not saying that there has to be evacuations, but there was, I can't remember the name of the town. There was a town in Wisconsin that is relocating yeah. because the town's in a flood zone and it keeps flooding. So they're just like, we're moving it. Forget yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you can't move the Pacific Northwest, but I mean, it's a standing joke with my friends out there where they're just like, the big one's coming. It's like, you're talking about your impending doom, you know? Well, I was, I was watching Jurassic Park not too long ago. Excellent. So when I was reading this story and going over some things, like that line from Jeff Goldblum about life, finding a way yeah, that just seemed to resonate here. Like, <laughs> man, they're talking about some pretty serious stuff going on here. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I don't know what level of infrastructure investment can be made to prevent some really catastrophic things from happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Life well, finds a way with a third less people. <sighs> Ugh, yikes. Well, and like just, just shake alert, something like shake alert. Like if a catastrophic flood is coming, like what, what does 45 seconds give you? You Get know what to I mean? The like, yeah. It's not like you're just like trying to grab a interior wall on that. I don't know. It's just get under a door jam. There's more to it, but I don't know. I to Jeff's point, I think you know we talk about infrastructure a lot at the federal level, mm-hmm. as if this is the federal level's problem to solve. Um, but there's a lot at the state level. Um, if you look at a dam, like most of these are state or local property. So um, this could be some serious spending they're talking about. Like, you know, right now what Jeff mentioned, that short-term solution, lowering the water level on that lake. Um, But they are already saying, like, look, uh, this is probably not just like a one and done. This isn't really a solution. They have to potentially spend a lot more um, to address some of the risk here. Um, And so that could be very costly at the state level. Yeah, what does it cost to lower a lake by five feet? Or or bolster a dam to withstand a seismic shift. I mean, that could be a crazy amount of money. I don't know. Well, but. this is a this is a huge dam too. I mean, this created yeah. a nine mile long lake. I mm-hmm. mean, just the amount of mm-hmm. water. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Hopefully, they find a solution that isn't just a numbers game about who's expendable. Yeah. The fourth most popular story on the website this week is equally grim. A water brand was linked to liver illness in kids. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has warned everyone not to drink, cook with, sell, or serve Real Water, a Las Vegas-based bottled water brand. Real Water has been linked to liver illness in five hospitalized children specifically with acute non-viral hepatitis, which is caused by exposure to toxins, autoimmune disease, or drinking too much alcohol. Real water is marketed in boxy blue plastic bottles as mineral-rich, alkalized, and infused with negative ions. And if it sounds like I'm saying real water a lot, it's because it is an attempt to make sure that you don't drink, cook with, sell, or serve real water. Anna, your thoughts on water <laughs> making livers fail in kids? Uh, my thoughts are this is not good. Like, um, understandable. Yeah. Put on a limb there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Risky take, Anna. Uh, take. <laughs> no, I mean, I think this one surprised some people. I think we probably take for granted the safety of certain products when they're labeled made in the USA mm-hmm. and they're distributed via a brand that has like a professional website and established distribution partners and resellers, including in this case, Whole Foods and Costco. I mean, those are big name companies. You kind of trust what they have on their shelves, right? But like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think you almost expect that stuff that comes from the other part of the world with more lax regulatory environment or something you buy in a marketplace, like that might be a risk. But in this case, in plain sight on Real Water's website, uh, beneath its lengthy list of bulleted quote benefits, Mm -hmm. um, There is a disclaimer that reads, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. But, you know, some of the stuff, like I watched their promotional video on their website Mm -hmm. where they talk about the technology. It's called, they hold an exclusive license for this technology they call electron energized or E2 technology. (laughs) It Um, sounds great. yeah, yeah, it was very um, surreal, but it's the idea is that basically like other waters have been stripped of their natural electrons, thus causing 
free radical damage within your body. And I think people generally associate free radicals with cancer. Mm. So that's not really a light emphasis exactly. Um, and like the video on their website makes it sound like other water is just like sucking your life force. It's really alarming and probably very effective marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, not evaluated by the FDA. Uh, and then suddenly you have these cases where there, you know, this attorney for one of the families is saying there were four separate households, um, all sickened in the same way. The only link is this water. Mm -hmm. uh, so it will be interesting to see how this plays out, but just really a uh, scary, s alarming situation for consumers, I think. Yeah. I don't remember when they started. I know it was in my lifetime when they started selling water, but I remember thinking, this seems like a move in the wrong direction. Um, Why would you buy water in a bottle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and to your point on the website, it was marketed as the healthiest drinking water available. Uh, and it asked retailers to pull it off the shelves immediately and hold it in back rooms or return it to the distributors. Even though the specific problem, I believe, was linked to water that was delivered to homes. But the other thing that I've found troubling on their website was uh, sort of the uh, star mongering, if you will. Uh, we already have a problem with like uh, fame in this culture, but you know, it's marketed as world famous singer Kesha, world famous actress Ava Longoria, world famous DJ Paul Oakenfold, and world famous singer Mel Melanie Brown with celebrities pictured drinking real water because they love it. Although mm -hmm. endorsements are not paid or otherwise compensated, but it has significantly more real estate on the website than the recall information. So, hey, Scary Spice drinks real water. Also, maybe return it because it might be killing your kids. Uh, sorry, I get really frustrated, uh, especially when it doesn't seem like they're taking this seriously. And also, man, of all the rights we should have as a human, I believe like clean, free water should be one of them since, you know, we needed to live. Well, I mean, that's kind of the ironic thing here. Like if they just would have drank in the water out of the tap, they would have avoided this. Yeah. And, and the reality is this particular type of bottled water, and I was doing a little research here, like the FDA has nine different classifications for bottled water. Really? That you can buy. And half of them, or almost half of them, it's basically just something that they take from the municipal tap and run it through some filtering and mm -hmm. do some other processes to it. So it's, in this instance, if they wouldn't have done that, yeah, and then had it, you know, stored for home delivery. It actually would have been healthier. And there's never been any science that actually backs up any of these claims that any of these processes, or even getting stuff from a stream or a glacier runoff or anything like that, is actually healthier. Mm -hmm. It's still water. Yeah, and a lot of the the processes that were done here by this company, they were doing, they're trying to reduce the acidic level. Less acid is supposed to be healthier, but again, there's no science to back that up. Mm -hmm. The stuff coming out of the tap is like within one point on the on the pH level in terms of difference. So, and I think this one actually was 7.8 to 8, the difference in pH levels between tap water. Mm -hmm. So whatever they did, didn't do a whole lot, and then it actually, I mean, it made these folks sick. Well, it's... Uh, allegedly. Yeah, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly sick. Uh, and that's a really interesting point, Jeff, that uh, if people would have had real water instead of real water, they'd be fine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's, I mean, it sounds terrible, but like I'm uh, against the bottled water industrial complex. It's just, uh, it's an issue for me. And we're out of time. And you're keyed up today, so better let it go. <laughs> and we're out of time. And, and we're out of time. Take that water. It's coming next time. Uh, <laughs> They'll find you. Water finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mysterious drowning grips podcast host. Uh, <laughs> the third most popular uh Story on the site this week was GM pickups are now less efficient. The semiconductor shortage is forcing GM to move along production of certain 2021 light duty pickup models without standard fuel management modules. The chip is responsible for deactivating some cylinders in an engine when possible to improve fuel efficiency. GM says fuel economy will be reduced by one mile per gallon. One mile, Jeff. Well, we did run a story this week also talking about how they think the, some of the, I guess for lack of a better term, damage that was done to a lot of the oil and gas companies will not be able to ever be recouped just mm -hmm. because there was so much less travel when people were locked in oh. and with the pandemic and all that. 
And they're talking about those basically just they're never getting back some of that business because people have changed their their uh, the way they go about doing things. So maybe if you want to put your conspiracy hat on here, maybe the you know the oil companies are getting behind this chip shortage and inflating. Um, um, gas efficiency. Mm, the oil companies bought yeah. all the chips no. yeah. and yeah, they exactly. buried them in the backyard. Big yeah. oil is taking down big semiconductor. Mm. Um, no, I thought it was interesting that like, if you look at the t- gas mileage, the 2020 Ford F-150 gets 28 miles per gallon on the highway. The 2020 Chevy Silverado about 33. The Ram 1500 about 32. Uh, and so when I just... In t- laboratory tests. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, so when I took a mile off of those, I guess I just started to care less. Uh Anna, do you care less? I, I don't know. I mean, it. we're trying to go in the other direction, you know? Yeah. Um, GM said that this is not going to dramatically impact their, uh, you know, fuel, like, standards, right? Mm-hmm. They, had, like, try to keep a certain efficiency standard, and they're trying to reach these goals uh, via the EPA. Um, so GM said that they're okay doing this in the short term, but they said they're going to be doing it for the less, the rest of the year. So I don't know, a mile a gallon on their most popular selling vehicle. That's like, that's real emissions. You know, I, I, I get your point, but it's, I don't think we should like undercut really what's, what's happening. No, I understand that. And I, I mean, what's the alternative They don't make trucks this year. They don't. That's the alternative is that they just, yeah. I mean, like right now it's impacting every automaker, right? So Mm -hmm. like. Except Toyota. Oh, except Toyota. I believe. Um, Well, so what I, what we've seen this week, right. Um, Mm -hmm. Ford says that it will be building its F-150s and edges without certain computers Mm -hmm. as well as holding some of their F-series models in the plant until those computers are available. So the supply of those F-series trucks is expected to tighten which is meaningful since that is the top selling vehicle in the United States and the automaker or the auto market ended 2020 on a high note. And I, I, I think we should remember that like with tax refunds and stimulus checks, like double teaming it right now, that's like right now automakers are probably like, we cannot press pause right now. There's no way that we can limit availability of our best selling vehicles when people have, you know, for lack of a better term, money to burn. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Did you see like, uh, because in terms of like buying new cars with the, you know, removing the computer and the, uh, some of these other functionalities are the, is the price coming down at all? I don't think they're going to sell them. I think they're basically sitting until they get, get the computers and then they can take them out. I think they're still available for pre-order and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so I think they're still going to have the production, but it, at the same point, it's going to limit production without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, and it's my understanding that GM mm-hmm. is selling them without those computers. Oh, really? Devices. Did without you, those devices. Yeah. That, I believe GM is. I think maybe Ford is holding them and adding yeah. the computers when they're ready. But, but still not cheaper. I don't think so. It's like the opposite of VW last week where they're like, you're going to have everything and then pay a la carte. They're like, you're going to have less and pay the same. Well, inventory levels are so low when you try to buy a new vehicle right now that mm-hmm. people are willing to pay. And like Anna said, there's stimulus funds coming in there to play a part. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think that's as big a issue or a challenge as it would have been in the past. So you're saying that I should use my stimulus to buy a new car and not boutique pretzels that I've been purchasing? <laughs> boutique <laughs> pretzels. David, whatever you're doing to stimulate the economy, it's working. Hey, it's just Kringle's Gourmet, man. It. Check that out. The, the one thing I think is interesting in terms of from a supply chain perspective, though, is when you look at electric vehicles and a lot of the efforts that automakers want to make to grow that side of the business and this chip shortage where some of these high-end EVs, I mean, they can take three times as many chips as a standard vehicle. You kind of wonder long-term what's it going to do to those production plans and, and that strategy as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It'll slow that down. That's a great point too, because like, so they're saying that like a lot of the supply that the automakers were used to getting was diverted to consumer electronics when the pandemic hit. Um, Like our, I mean, device sales, it's my understanding that they're still very high. Um, And I don't know, is that going down? (laughs) Like, is this a problem that's easily solved? I don't think so. I mean, they're expecting that this shortage is going to last at least through the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, it's not like quick to like, I know that there's some projects in the works for some chip plants that we've covered recently. And 
Um, you know, some of it had to do with those Texas plants being thrown off by the blackouts and that there were some right. plants in Japan, I think, um, that got hit by a, what, a typhoon? Er- earthquakes, yeah. Earthquake yeah. earlier this year. Yeah. So, so there were some, you know, uh, some hurdles that don't necessarily need to be repeated, but from a demand standpoint, and to Jeff's point, demand is just getting bigger and bigger, or in this case, worse and worse. <laughs> right. Well, it definitely led to the fear mongers on the websites to suggest some suggest that there should be a 50 to 100 percent tax on trucks Whew. from commenter. I don't have to save you. Who needs a hug? Might make a few people finally come to their senses and realize pickup trucks should be for work, not greenhouse gas belching suburban status symbols. Sadly, most people will still purchase them. So you can pay for some of those desperately needed social and infrastructure programs. And then IG simply asked, who are you or anyone to tell people what to drive? So at least people out there are keeping a cool head about it. Always. (laughs) The next most popular story this week, repeated amputations at an ice cream plant in New Jersey. Fairbrook, Fairbrook Foods is owned by Wells Enterprises which makes and sells Blue Bunny, Blue Ribbon, Original Bomb Pop, and other brands. Wells is the largest privately held, family-owned ice cream manufacturer in the U.S., and they produce about 150 million gallons of ice cream per year. But Fairbrook has had some safety problems. Back in 2018, a sanitation worker at Fairbrook in New Jersey lost a finger and fractured another when his hand got caught in the crimping bar of a jammed ice cream wrapping machine. It happened again in September 2020 when a maintenance mechanic lost two fingers to the same machine. For repeated lockout tagout violations, OSHA has proposed $237,000 in penalties. Jeff, is that enough for them to stop losing fingers in Jersey? I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week when we talked about the top 10 OSHA citations and lockout tagout is always a big one. For food plants, I think a lot of it is, and I'm not not justifying some of the, the lack of safety protocols that were in place here, but food, again, we've talked about this, the margins are so low. Mm-hmm. And if you've been through the frozen aisle and the number of ice cream products and popsicles and things like that that are there right now, the competition is fierce. So when you're looking at potentially stopping a machine to clean it out and take more time to do that, there's a lot of pressure there. Yeah. So I think shortcuts are going to be taken and they come maybe equally or not always just from a complete neglect perspective, but also just in trying to get as much product down and done as possible, as quickly as possible, because it is such a profit sapping dynamic. Now it doesn't excuse mm-hmm. what happened here in any way, shape or form. But I think that's why we see maybe a disproportionate number of these in processing facilities in yep. food facilities. Because the low they're, margin. Yeah, because there's just so much pressure to keep those machines going and get as much product out the door. Well, Auntie M from Kansas on the website says, how basic can safety be, yet they deliberately ignore it? I guess fines are less trouble than doing things correctly. This is something that should be investigated further. These are not complicated safety measures. I'm no longer buying their brands. Maybe customer awareness will help. Now, I am more of a Prairie Farms and Cedar Crest guy, family, if you will. Uh, Anna, do you think maybe it won't be the... OSHA fines, but it'll be, you know, consumer feedback. Yeah. I mean, Jeff mentioned this, uh, there's, it's, there's a lot of competition. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think like, you know, we talk about what are good preventative measures to take and fines are sort of a reactionary way to address this, but the impact on your brand is important. And I would think that a well-known consumer product like bomb pops or blue bunny you know, it's not a good look mm-hmm. and the freezer section is a vast <laughs> place and yeah. it's, it's easy to buy another product. So, you know, I don't think it, it, it looks good for them to continue to do this. Although to Jeff's point, like they're not alone. I mean, lockout tag out for as basic as we want to believe that that is, um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, you know, it hits our top 10 list every year. Mm-hmm. More than 2,000 citations uh, related to that last year. And keep in mind, this was in a calendar year where fewer citations were awarded due to the shutdowns and other pandemic-related issues. So um, it's still a big problem. Uh, and OSHA says that you know standard lockout-tagout prevention saves an estimated 
120 lives every year. Um, and so how many was it? 120 lives and 50,000 injuries wow. every, every year. Um, and so if, if you have an incident and, and that doesn't change the way you operate, it's sort of mind blowing. And keep in mind too, if OSHA decides that one of these lockout tagout safety infractions is the result of willful behavior and say a person were to die, the individual overseeing this can be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars and the company um, fined up to half a million dollars. So like an individual manager um, could see a fine of a quarter of a million dollars if somebody were to die on their watch. Wow. And I got a feeling that the uh, company might not stand behind them on that one if they're battling their own million dollar mm -hmm. citation. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you had another note on here. Um, just because this particular piece was a video that we ran on the site, uh, you had mentioned the company's previous name. Mr. Cookie Face? Yeah. It took me a lot wow. to get through that one. Like, there is yeah. just, there is minutes of me trying to say Mr. Cookie Face and continue the story. Yeah. I'm also going to mute that, my computer. That sounds like the, you know, the Joker took over a cookie factory or something like that. Right? Like, That's, is that a real yeah. brand or is this like a fictional yeah. brand in the DC universe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like some C-level villain from this the 70s. Like yeah. A cover for right? something. <laughs> Batman battles. They'll never expect us here. Yeah. It's Mr. Cookie Face. <laughs> The Mr. Cookie Face Factory. It has a giant red smile. It's not frosting. That's blood. <laughs> oh, whew. going dark today. I know. Allegedly. Alle <laughs> <laughs> the top story this week, the NHTSA to investigate Tesla semi, semi crash. The National Highway Trans <clears throat> Traffic Safety Administration sent a special crash investigation team to Detroit, Michigan this time to investigate a violent crash involving a Tesla that drove beneath a semi-trailer. Two people were critically injured in the crash, which is similar to others in Florida in which Teslas drew, <clears throat> drove beneath trailer tractors, causing two deaths. In both crashes in 2016 and 2019, the cars were driven <clears throat> using Tesla's autopilot, partially automated driving software. Tesla has previously said that autopilot and, quote, full self-driving are driver assistance systems and that the driver should be ready to intervene at all times. Anna, your thoughts on calling it autopilot still? Ugh, I don't know. I mean, I think the term autopilot, while fun, has a certain connotation for most people, which is sort of like a hands behind the head, kicking back, <laughs> your effort not required. <laughs> yeah. Right? And you know, Tesla has been pressured for years to change the name. This is not new. In fact, last year, a U.S. Senator, Edward Markey, uh, Edward Markey, excuse me, called on Tesla to rebrand the system, calling it a misleading name. And mm -hmm. Tesla continues to add features it says um, will enhance driver accountability requirements. Like uh, recently, um, they modified the steering wheel monitor to be able to sort of detect what's a, a sleeping, like a limp sleeping mm. hand or an impaired hand, which is honestly hard to believe, but okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here's the deal. Like there's six levels of autonomous vehicle if you're a nerd, because one of those six is level zero, which is no autonomy. <laughs> That's just a person. Yeah. So I don't say we include that. Right. <laughs> I don't know. To, to just say, hey, I drive a zero-level autonomous vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm still at zero cool? level. It, yeah. It's not cool, though. No, that's no. something we say to our grandchildren. <laughs> just like, we're still at a level zero. Yeah. Just like, okay, grandpa. Yeah, and then I they drive. fire us. Yeah, they say, okay, boomer, and fire us. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, never had, I never had to learn how to drive. <laughs> so there are five levels. <laughs> really? And anyway, it's in those lower numbers that um, the systems that exist today live, like with level six being completely full autonomy. Autopilot is considered by SAE standards to be at level two. Level two is basically where the car can do like steering, acceleration, but the driver must still be ready to take the wheel. Mm -hmm. And that is nothing close to this concept where you can just sit back and watch a movie and zone out. Right. And look, I don't know the circumstances of this specific incident, so I can't speak to that. But I do know that... We've seen these types of incidents repeated mm -hmm. where the driver kind of relied on the autopilot system to do too much or more than it's really capable of. Yeah, the Uber driver watching the voice, right, that mowed down the pedestrian. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, but that, yeah, that was not a Tesla. That was a Volvo. But um, Right. But yeah, I, you know, I, I think, 
I, I don't think that Tesla needs to be held liable for driver error, mm -hmm. but I do think that something as basic as a name change would acknowledge that the system is not, in fact, an autopilot in the sense of the word that most people, I think, have. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think we should change the name of the automatic transmission. Yeah. D just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you're playing the uh, drinking game at home, uh, prepare to take a shot because it's been another bad week for Tesla, <laughs> which we say we're talking about Elon Musk again, right? Uh, as NHTSA actually sent another special gra crash investigation team out after a Tesla on autopilot or whatever the new term is going to be crashed into a Michigan state police cruiser that had its lights flashing on the freeway. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts on autopilot in general and possible rebrand here well this this story was a bit conflicting for me because and, and you guys know me pretty well who have i been more critical of federal agency overreach Ooh. or elon musk whoa jeff what's gonna happen you it's know super so who do you who do you go after here and the answer is both yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay because first of all and, and looking at the story here just kind of quoting it says but the company which is tesla has been criticized by the national transportation safety board for failing to adequately monitor drivers to make sure they are paying attention mm -hmm. How is Tesla supposed to make people drive and operate their vehicle? Better? Oh, no, right. that's, I agree with that's you. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So coming after Tesla and saying they're at fault for these crashes is, no. In my opinion, that's ridiculous. Okay. Tesla is not at fault for these. Mm -hmm. And Tesla does get way too much attention whenever these incidents occur. Mm -hmm. I agree. But they're Tesla. And Elon Musk invites this because he will not let this autopilot thing go. Mm -hmm. Other vehicles have similar platforms. Yeah. Um, Cadillac has a very similar functionality for some of their higher scale SUVs. And they don't tout it though. They say what it is. It's not something they push. It's not something that is part of a huge part of their marketing campaigns. It's there. Yeah. Because it's still not in beta form, but it's what it is. It's to help. It's to support. It's not to take over the vehicle. To Anna's point, when you call something autopilot, that means you get up and you kind of go to the backs of the plane and you figure out something else to do while this navigates. Right. Well, that's not what this is. And that's why these horrible things keep happening. So does NHTSA need to work with Tesla to maybe educate, help Tesla educate people better or to tell Tesla to ease up off of this because their marketing is being too effective and people right. are using it wrong? Yeah. But it's not Tesla's fault that these things happen. No, that's, I mean, uh, that's a really good point. And uh, I do think that we, like, people sometimes neglect that is that at the end of the day, as a driver of a vehicle, of a vehicle you are ultimately responsible for mm -hmm. what it does. And I mean, you're right. Stop calling it autopilot and just call it level two of six. Maybe that'll really drive it home. Level two of six. There, yeah. there are so many things five. Tesla, can, five. <laughs> Tesla can, can push and market. Let this one go, man. Yeah. Let it go. So yeah. do you think though, if there's an attorney listening to this, please enlighten us. Like, from a legal standpoint, does changing the name um, is that is that Tesla like acknowledging or admitting oh, that they misrepresented fault. the technology and opened them up to litigation? I'm not sure. Um, so, so I guess if if, Can't they if anyone just, knows, tell us. But it, can you legally argue we just gave humans way too much benefit of the doubt? <laughs> I, you can just stop talking about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. true, as a feature. Yeah. I mean, just, just let it go. Yeah. Because uh, that's what he's good at. Just let it go. Mm -hmm. Water <laughs> off a duck's back. <laughs> David Manti and yeah. Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> Two peas in a pod. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait till Sunday night when I'm still stewing over that comment. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to our next segment. In case you missed it, I'd like to start off this one just because after putting the rundown together this week, a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of doom and gloom. And, uh, you know, we had other stories that were sort of popular in terms of odor control with uh, communities and a pet food manufacturer. But what I really liked was a story that came out of Mac Molding in Virginia, where the Mac Molding facility passed 1,000 days without a lost time accident. And it's just, I mean, the Jim from the Office YouTube show was extremely popular for a reason because sometimes it's just nice to have good news. Uh, Mac Molding is a custom plastics molder and contract manufacturer. Last week, the company's facility on East Arlington Road in Virginia passed 1,000 days without a lost time accident. Congratulations to all the workers at that facility. 
The plant's previous record was 981 to celebrate plant leadership made Rubens on St. Patty's Day. That's just a feel-good story. I mean, the Rubens in the photo looked a little light on the corned beef. Whatever. It was free. But uh, I just wanted to also put a note that if there are more stories like this, if your facility is just killing it right now, poor choice of words, doing really well from a safety perspective, send it in. Because I'd like to know how many other manufacturers out there, how they stack up when it comes to a thousand day mark. You know, are you getting close? Are you way over that? Be really interested in hearing about it. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of facilities out there doing the right thing. Obviously, I mean, there's not to, it's not exactly apples to apples, but we hear about Tesla, right? And oh, yeah. all their crashes, there's other stuff going on there. There's a lot of good things with those, those vehicles as well. Similarly, we do tend to showcase a lot of these bad things that happens at facilities. Ideally, it's a learning tool right. to, to show it what should not be going on. And, yeah, it's awesome that these folks have been able to do that and for over, well, roughly three years um, doing the right thing. Uh, Anna, for St. Patty's Day, never mind, you're a vegetarian. Jeff, for St. Patty's Day, did you do straight corned beef or did you just do a Reuben? I did corned beef and cabbage, man. I love it. Yeah. It's good stuff. I just made the largest pot of it. <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> that was a couple days ago. Um, Anna, uh, any thoughts on, you know, some of the people doing well in the industry? Uh, yeah, that's great. I mean, it, I agree that it's fun to see, see this stuff uh, covered. And I'm glad that, you know, it takes sometimes it takes a facility like issuing their own press release for people to ever know about this stuff. Right. Um, and so we, you know, from our perspective, I would encourage those of you who have something to be proud of to send it to us, send us a press release, um, let the industry know, we'll put it out there. Um, I think it's a good feel good opportunity for everyone to see right. that stuff. It doesn't have to be a press release. It could be an email and a picture of the boss making sandwiches. That's true. Yeah. We'll make it work. Go. <laughs> uh, Anna, what was your just in, in case you missed it this week? In case you missed it, everybody. <laughs> Breakfast cereal is back. <laughs> no. <laughs> was yeah. it ever gone? It, was it ever gone? You might ask. Well, <laughs> here's the, here's the story, David. Um, it seems the pandemic is boosting sales for processed foods, makers like Post and General Mills. And the reasons are pretty interesting. Uh, so they say that kids cereals, um, were already doing okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but now they're like gangbusters An executive at Post said that it's Pebbles sales were quote on fire, which is funny because I was a huge Pebbles fan when I was a kid mm -hmm. and I can almost like feel the greasy film. It leaves on the roof of your mouth just talking about this. Do you guys, you remember that? Like, I don't do fruity just, flavored cereals. Oh, I love the like fruity a, pebbles. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just no. like a slick up there. <laughs> um, <laughs> just what yeah. a way to start the day. Yeah. Yeah. I ate her fruity pebbles with Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> Breakfast yeah. cereals back in style. Still gross. Didn't Animals. I have, yeah, didn't I have parents? What? Um, but oh, okay, so the other side of this is that there's significant growth being seen from what's traditionally like grown up cereals. Um, and if you're on social media, you may be aware of the great grape nuts shortage of a few weeks back, which apparently threw some <laughs> cereal lov lovers into like a huge tizzy. But that has been resolved. Hold on a, a second. Were they short? Were they using it for gravel or yeah. something? Or what? Jeff yeah, I and I were both flabbergasted. Yeah, they were. I think they were um, like like using it as a additive to build stronger roads. Yeah, um, maybe to melt all the salt stuff, yeah. ice and, <laughs> and snow was, or something. Using right, instead salt. of salt and beet juice, it's really just <laughs> grape, grape nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the what what these cereal makers are suggesting is that there's two types of adults driving wallet share in cereal sales. There are older adults who are looking for comfort food and nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And conversely, there are younger adults who are giving cereal a try for the first time. And the reason cereal is new to millennials, and I don't like to bag on millennials, but this is funny, is because it's not grab and go and bowls are a hassle to wash. So they, previous to the pandemic, they were not eating cereal. <laughs> Hold on. Let's not, let's not, I, I don't think this is on millennials. I think this is on parents of millennials. Bowls I mean, are a hassle to wash. So I know, like. It, this will never stop being funny to me. Like, I know that bowls are a hassle to wash. Like, everything is a hassle to wash. Yeah. Like, you don't see me throwing my clothes away after one wear. Like, I what mean, do you... Get, I've been there, though. Get out of here. No. <laughs> um, well, that blows my mind. Bowls are not a hassle to wash. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what kind of groundbreaking insight we could offer other than, yeah. like... And it's probably going to taste better than... Uh, 
you know, whatever you grab and go, because any sort of breakfast bar that I've ever had yeah. is gross. Because <laughs> you love things with fruit in the middle of them. David's gross. favorite. No. Yeah, some sort of like a... Nutri-gain bar or something. I need fruit Big that tastes like fruit. I don't need fruit-flavored <laughs> yeah. anything else. Nice. Um, I was always a Tony the Tiger guy. Tony the Tiger? I love Frosted Flakes. I love Post makes this cereal called O's. And talk about like, if you think Captain Crunch just slices you up, eat a bowl of O's. O's. Because also, I've never been so aware of the sugar content in cereals until I started feeding it to my kid. And I'm like... Why did he become a small maniac after breakfast? Mm-hmm. It's because it's the post O's. It's because the O's have like two times your daily sugar <laughs> in one bowl, and it's like this man, also, I would like crush a box. This also <laughs> explains your dental adventures too, maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, no, there's hey, man. you should throw some grave notes at your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Des is uh, Des is big into the Sesame Street cereal, and I feel like it's learning. It's also lower sugar count, and I mean it's either letters or numbers, so we're all learning at Look that at kitchen you. table. Look at you, <laughs> oh nice, Jeff. What did we miss this week? Well, I was surprised this story actually didn't make it into the top ten, but we ran a story about a um, a homemade narco submarine being seized by police in Spain. Now, we've run some stories on this before. Usually it was um, the cartels like in South America trying to get stuff up to uh, to North America. Mm-hmm. But uh, this one was in Spain. And basically what it looks like is they took like a regular like speedboat and just built some plywood on it yeah. so that it could sit lower because it could hold um, 2.2 tons of cargo. Now, if there's two people in there, that's obviously a lot of room for drugs. Yeah. So, and what they assumed with the two 200 horsepower engines that were also operated from inside the vessel, that basically it was leaving shore in Spain, going out into um, the Atlantic Ocean, meeting up with a much larger boat mm-hmm. that would then um, take the drugs into, like, distribute throughout Europe. So, but I mean, you know, it just kind of, it's like that, that, that evil genius type of thing going on here. Like, on one hand, it's like, this is a pretty impressive engineering but it was used for horrible things. Yeah. So maybe I mean, they also had toys in there. I mean, <laughs> maybe they were smuggling toys and yeah, drugs and drugs. Yeah. Teddy bears and cocaine. Um, it sounds like a rock band name. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and I mean, there's kind of a, a precedent for this. Like we've seen a lot of some pretty ingenious engineering in terms for illegal smuggling, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's marine craft or airplanes or other devices that have been used to to get drugs into uh, to the country. But this one, again, just sort of conflicting because on one hand, you appreciate the effort, just not the <laughs> application. Use no, your skills so, for good instead yeah. of evil. It's like old school learning from your, uh, what you learn in school is that like you find out that even, no, like when you try twice as hard to cheat, you still learned, you know, you still learned the lesson. I mean, this is like uh, trying to cheat the system. This is incredibly innovative, even though it kind of looks like an enclosed swimming pool that is submersible. It, it does look like a big bathtub. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But it's, it's got portholes on it. I mean, two engines inside, so it was running quiet. And it sat right at the water level, and it's blue, so difficult to see, potentially. Yeah. Now, they got this one before it was actually even launched. Oh, okay. I was so, going to say, how do you find this? Yeah, so like if, yeah, if they didn't... Uh, they weren't tipped off in some way to get it before it got in the water. It probably would have worked. Right. If I were to drive past this, I would just think, man, some maker out there is about to die. Like... <laughs> I mean, when we see some of the uh, flying, the homemade flying cars and other homemade cars, that's what this reminds me of. Where it's like, I mean, they're going to launch it. I don't know where it's going. But think about like just how valuable, like dollar wise, what they're putting in there is. Yeah. Like, you know, it's going to work. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure what the street value is on uh, two metric tons of drugs. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I don't know that. <laughs> um, Anna, final thought this week. What do you got for the viewers, listeners at home? <clears throat> um, you know, it's been a good week he- here. The weather's getting, it snowed, but now the weather's getting nice again. And, and like lots of people in my life are getting vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And that's just really exciting. So I'm feeling some optimism. It's, it's spring. And so there's maybe like a light at the end of the tunnel. And then there's also literal light again because daylight <laughs> savings time. Uh, brought the sun back into our lives, so I don't know. It's, Man, it's just keep keep it positive. Brought the sun back into our lives. It's just a lot of levels there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get hugs later. Um, no, that's true. It's uh, the vaccination efforts, particularly in Wisconsin, have been impressive, and uh, you know I hope that uh, that can serve as a model for other areas around the uh, the U.S. 
Um, Jeff, final thought? I'm glad Anna didn't try to tell me to stop this week like she did last time. I can so, if you want. Do you want me to tell you no. to tell you now? No, I'm good. Okay. You could, if you could wait a couple of minutes when we're done, that'd be fine. So that was a positive. Yeah. I, I didn't, get, didn't get shut out this week. Um, yeah, I'm kind of with Anna. Just like spring, we're talking baseball. Yeah. March Madness. Yeah, it's good yeah, stuff. You still confident that Wisconsin's going to advance? I think they'll win their first round game. Okay. I'm not going to comment after that. <laughs> <laughs> not on Not on record. Yeah. Very good. Uh, well, my final thought this week, other than send us anything that's going on in your facility that's going well, we would be happy to share that with, their, uh, with the readers and people have been responding. Uh, also, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share the podcast. We really appreciate all the efforts so far and as well as the positive feedback. Uh, to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. And if you get a chance, please subscribe to one of our newsletters and you'll make sure that you get this first. Uh, Well, for Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti, and this has been the Today in Manufacturing podcast. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.